We're looking at 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 13 through 17 this morning as we continue going through this book called 1 Peter. Now, I'll begin reading at verse 13. I'll read to verse 17 and we'll get into our study. The Apostle Peter writes, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, And therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme, or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, yet not using your liberty as a cloak for vice, but as servants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Now, we've been going through 1 Peter, and as you know, the Apostle Peter has been giving certain directives towards believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's been exhorting his belie the, the believers, his readers, and, and by application, he's been exhorting all believers to live godly lives. Now, that word godly, once again, is, is part of our vocabulary as Christians. We use the word godly, but there are those who perhaps don't know what that word means. The word godly speaks of an attitude. It speaks of an attitude that desires to be pleasing to God. It is character and conduct that is motivated by the fear of God and a love for God. So when a person is living a godly life, it's motivated for love, by love for God, a fear of God, and it's actually something that, that reveals an attitude that desires to be pleasing to God. This is godliness. Now, godliness is not something that you automatically have. You get saved and suddenly you're godly. It doesn't work that way. Godliness is actually part of the discipline of a Christian life. You actually pursue it. It's something that you seek after. It's not something that automatically happens because you got saved. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Timothy 4, verse 7, reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. So it's something that you discipline yourself to. It's a way of life. It's a way of life that is lived out in front of believers and unbelievers alike. When you want to find certain scriptures that may give the qualities of godliness, that's not hard to do. You could see 1 Timothy, for example, chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And though that passage is referring to the qualifications of leadership in the church, because it begins with the words, if any man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good thing. And so you know that these things that you find in chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, are really the attributes of a godly leader. Yet you can, by way of application, look at some of those things that he says, as a matter of fact, all of those things, and apply them to yourself. So if you want to live a life that is godly, all you need to do is look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 and begin to evaluate what is he saying there. Because there, Paul gives a list of qualities of godliness. He speaks of having a good reputation. He speaks of having moral purity, being balanced in word and action. A person who is godly is wise and humble, a good role model. They are unselfish and generous. They communicate in a non-threatening manner. A person who is godly is not addicted to substances, is not somebody who controls other people. They're not quick to anger. They're not abusive. A person who is pursuing godliness is sensitive and kind, non-argumentative. They are free from the love of money. They're a good spouse, a good parent. They pursue godly activities. They're wise. They're not prejudiced. They're devoted to God, and they're disciplined. These are things that you can see as qualities of godliness. And so when I speak concerning godliness, those are the things that I'm speaking about, and and the Apostle Peter here in 1 Peter has been exhorting us as believers to live godly lives. Now, part of the reason why we live godly lives is we understand that we're just passing through. He had said that we are sojourners. He said that we are pilgrims. And being sojourners and pilgrims means that we do certain things. In verse 11, he said that means that we abstain from what he refers to as fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. So if a person is living a godly life, what they're doing is they're avoiding certain things. They are actually abstaining from things that would be called sins of the flesh. When he speaks about these sinful lusts, by the way, these are the sinful impulses that continually carry on a campaign for dominance in our lives. 
These are the impulses that we as human beings deal with on a continual basis. You see, the old nature that we, that we have struggles against the new nature for dominance. There's a war that's going on. It's an internal civil war. There's a war that goes on within us. And Paul speaks about that in Romans chapter 7, verses 18 through 20, when he says, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. There's a war going on within me. Paul would say, I want to do what is right, but there's a war that fights against me. It's a war within that attempts to keep me from doing that which I desire so much to do. All of us can understand that. Paul called these the lust of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5. In Galatians 5, 17 through 21, he said the lusts of the flesh he's, uh, are, are described here in this way. He says the, the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Then he lists them, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions and factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And he goes on to say, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't let anybody deceive you into believing that you can live in that manner and still be heaven bound. The apostle Peter said, no, we're pilgrims and we're sojourners. We, we have to deal with the fact that there are lusts that are warring against us at this moment. There's a conflict within. And so the entire answer to that is to pursue godliness, to seek the Lord and to do those things that are pleasing to him. So Peter is exhorting the people to abstain from these lusts. When he says that, he's saying, do not yield yourself to the impulse that wars within you, the war against the Spirit of God that dwells within you. You can be victorious. You can have a life that is evident that you are more than a conqueror. And Paul in Romans 6, 12 through 14 says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. Offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. You can win. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can make decisions that are pleasing to God and live a life that is blessed by him. That's why he says, don't let sin reign in your mortal body. That's why he says you can resist and you can actually have victory. We're to have, according to verse 12, conduct that is honorable among the Gentiles because they're going to speak against you. So my conduct is to be excellent in nature and characteristic amongst those who don't believe in God because the way that I live is going to reveal what I believe. Even as it says in Proverbs 20, verse 11, even a child is known by his actions, by whether his conduct is pure and right. What I believe, I'm going to do, and therefore I ought to do that which is pleasing to God, which demonstrates what I believe. You see, unbelievers are on the watch in order to see if you can lapse in your moral conduct. And so speaking of you in a way that is not proper is inevitable. But your righteous life should be of such quality that, that they see that the things that they're saying are not true. And then ultimately, they'll even glorify God in the day of visitation. In other words, either they're going to acknowledge God was with you when they stand before God, or they're going to watch your good works and they're going to be converted because of the quality of your life and the things that you share. Now, this is what he's been saying up to this point, And now he moves on into verse 13 here in chapter 2 by saying, Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. And so he's going to begin at this point to make a point that you're going to see developed over this chapter and into chapter 3. He begins to speak concerning the word submission. 
He uses the word here in verse 13. He also speaks of it in verse 18 and then in chapter 3, verse 1. What does it mean to submit? Well, submission means to subject yourself. It's a voluntary decision that you make to rank yourself below or under somebody who has superior authority. Here he's referring to submitting yourself to God's designed order for society. So the point he's making, and we'll be looking at this, if we're going to live lives that bring glory to God, it's going to occur when we have a life of quality, a life that, that people see is really sold out to Jesus Christ to affect change in the society, then we need to have change occur in us. Because the way that we are going to change the society that we live in, the culture that we live in, is to be changed by God Himself. And that comes through being transformed by the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's pointing out that, that changed lives are going to affect society, and so God would have us to be changed. How can I do that? Well, one, I'm to submit myself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. That word ordinance is a word that you can actually translate institution. It's a thing that's created by, by man for order. It's another word for government. Since submission is voluntary, he's saying sub submit, decide to submit for the Lord's sake. Now that's a difficult word, that word submission to me, it still is. You have to decide to submit. When Jesus on one occasion was being approached by a centurion, the centurion had a servant boy that was not well. And he wanted the Lord Jesus Christ to heal him. Jesus said to this centurion, this Roman military man, I'll go with you. The centurion said, no, no. Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof. All you need to do is speak a word, and my servant will be healed. For I, too, am a man under authority. I say to this one, go, and he goes. I say to another man, come here, and he comes. Jesus marvels at this man. He says, I haven't seen faith like this, no, not even in Israel, that this man who was a Gentile, not a, not a person under the covenant law of Moses, a Gentile, would understand the relationship that Jesus Christ had with his father because Jesus came to do the will of his father. It is written in the volume of the book, your book, he says, in the book of Hebrews, I have come to do thy will, O God. Jesus said, the words that I speak to you and the works that I perform are not originating in my own plans, but he said, I'm doing the will of my Father. Even in the garden where he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done is a demonstration of Jesus Christ being under authority. The centurion saw it. He recognized it. That's why he would say to him, I too am a man under authority. I see that you are a man under authority because a man who's not under authority is not to be trusted. Because a person who does not submit himself to anybody else is somebody that will be dangerous with my life. He understood that from military. You learn that in the military. You have people who are over you, superior to you in the military from an E1 in the army all the way up to the general. And there is a military kind of uh, a system of authority that you have to learn and you have to yield to. And if you don't yield to it, there are penalties. When I was in the military, I discovered that. Because I was in formation. We had a large company. There were 400 plus. And we all had to have formation at, at 8 o'clock in the morning. We all would stand in attention in formation and the company commander would address us. And that would, that would take place at uh, about 8 o'clock in the morning, every morning, Monday through Friday. And normally there would be somebody that would be assigned to address you if the company commander wasn't there. And on one occasion, I was standing there in formation, and a sergeant major was there who was going to address us. And as he was addressing us, he looked in my direction, and he said, Rosales, you've got, you've got extra duty. Report for extra duty tonight at 5. And I said, no. He said, what? He said, I said, report for extra duty at 5. And I said, I'm not going to. I'm not going to be there. You don't do that. You don't do that in the military. You just don't do that. But I was one of these rebellious kids. And I said, I'm not coming. And so he got all mad. I don't know why. He got all mad. I, I'm, I'm saying that in front of 400 
400 guys. No. So he says, come into my office. So I go walking into his office. He actually dismisses me and tells me to meet him in his office. I go into his office, and I go into the office. I'm thinking to myself, I know what he's going to do. He's going to come in. He's going to bluster. He's going to try and threaten me. He's going to act like he's this and that. He's a special forces guy, and he's going to try and scare me. I know what he's going to do. But I'm a Christian. And so I start to pray. I was a new Christian. I was a year old in the Lord. And the Lord convicts my heart. So here comes this guy. He walks in. He starts kind of throwing one of these moves on me to show me how in charge he is. Before he says anything, I said, before you say anything, I need to tell you something. I said, I showed you disrespect in front of the men, and for that I apologize. I said, I'm a Christian, and the Lord spoke to my heart and told me that what I did was improper and that I need to ask you for forgiveness. I'm sorry. Blew him away. He didn't know what to do with that. He really didn't. He didn't know what to do with that. He thought, you know, he was, you know, I don't know what he was thinking he was going to do, but he thought it was going to be different than that, I guarantee you. I reported for extra duty some other time because I had something I had to do. That's the reason I said no. I was already scheduled to do something else, but instead of uh, just approaching him with respect to, and telling him, you know, Sergeant, can't do that, but I'll be there when I can because I took the wrong route. See, I've learned something about submission to proper authority. I've learned it over the years, and I began to learn my lessons about that in the military in the military. I had a friend of mine, you know, that uh, was a living example of how you're supposed to submit and what you shouldn't do sometimes because my friend wouldn't get up in the morning. You have to get up at a certain time. And the sergeant came into his room and said, get up. And my friend was still in bed. Everybody was already up. He was supposed to be up and he's supposed to be active, but he's just laying in bed. And the sergeant came in there and said, get up, soldier. And he says, my friend tells the sergeant, he says, no. He said, did I come into your room and wake you up this morning? <laughs> I think he's still doing extra duty 40 years later. <laughs> so you have to learn your lessons of submitting to proper authority. In this particular context, we're seeing that, that the apostle is speaking about submitting to proper governmental authority. And so that's what he's speaking about here when he speaks about um, submitting to the king, submitting to governors and all. He's saying you need to submit. Now, submission is voluntary. So you decide to submit for the Lord's sake. Proverbs 24, 21, My son, fear the Lord and the king. Matthew 22, 21, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Romans 13, 1 through 3, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and he will commend you. You want to be free from fear? Obey the speed limit. Stop at stop signs. You know, you know what happens. You're on the freeway, you're driving. You've seen this happen. There's a CHP, a cruiser that's next to you. And you're wondering, why is everybody going so slow? They're actually going the speed limit. And you look in your mirror and you see this cruiser. Oh, he gets off the freeway and it's the start of the Indy 500. Boom, there goes everybody. That's what they do. They only obey as long as someone's there to bust them. You come to a stop sign, there's suggestions today, aren't they? Stop signs suggest, hey, I think it'd be cool, but there's nobody around here. After all, it's five in the morning. There's nobody in my neighborhood. I can blow through that. I'm, I'm late, right? So people, I see that in my neighborhood all the time. They, they think the stop sign is a suggestion, and it's not. It's a stop sign. Or we're supposed to go this speed limit because, you know, well, there's nobody around here except for me, and so I'll go as fast as I want until I see a cruiser behind me. Then all of a sudden I'm thinking, oh man, what's the first thing you do when you're driving and you see a police car behind you? It's the first thing you do. Do you look at your speedometer? Why? 
Because we speed. That's why it's obvious, isn't it? And oh, oh good. I'm in that five mile per hour. We credit ourselves. You know, it's really, it's not 25, it's really 30. 31, oh, I'm speeding. Not said 25. But that's just the way we are. And any officer will tell you that because I've spoken to my share. No, we don't give you a grace of five miles an hour. If you're going 26, you're speeding. They'll tell you that. It's a fact. I was driving to church and I got pulled over by a cop who goes to our church. <laughs> He's my brother-in-law. <laughs> but I wasn't speeding. Well, actually I was, but I didn't know it. See, there's a, right there on Riverside Drive, coming here on Pipeline, it's 45 miles an hour, and then it changes to 40. And I went through at 45, but the sign wasn't up that said 40, so he pulled me over. My brother-in-law <laughs> used to go to this church. <laughs> he says, Dave, you were speeding. I said, no, I wasn't. I was going 45. Well, are you sure? I said, well, you know what? It says it right back then. We, we argued, you know, in a nice brotherly way. But later on, he came up to me. He let me go. He came up later on, and he says, you know, you were speeding. I went back and checked that sign. I said, ha, ah, too late. <laughs> Bottom line is, is I have to learn, like everybody else, to discipline myself to do what is right. I submit. I make that mind up myself. I have to learn to do that. It's a choice that I make. Now, when it comes to government, we submit to laws. I'll show you something in just a moment. We submit to laws and all of that. But what happens when those who are in authority over you begin to tell you that you can't do certain things that violate your conscience as it relates to Jesus Christ? We have an example of that in Scripture, more than one really, but there was a time when the apostles, uh, Peter and John, resisted a clear command for them to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. It's recorded in Acts chapter 4, verses 17 through 20, and, and those who were uh, conspiring to try and stop the gospel said, to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and com commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. You judge for yourself. Is it right for us to obey man or is it right for us to obey God? We have to speak what God has commanded us and therefore we're going to continue speaking in His name. Now, when you resist that kind of evil, there will be consequences. But because they continued preaching, they content, continued sharing and ultimately got arrested again. Once again, they were threatened. In Acts 5, 40-42, it says, after that they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for His name. But notice, daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So even though they were commanded not to speak in the name of Christ and even suffered consequences through the beating, they continued to preach in the name of Jesus Christ. When the government establishes laws that forbid us from preaching, who do we obey? The government or the Lord? We obey the Lord. If you go into Canada as a minister, there are laws against you preaching the full counsel of God in Canada. I don't know if you know this or not, but there are, there are laws there. If I were to be teaching a study through the book of Romans and actually teach Romans chapter 1 the way it is intended to be taught, I can be cited for that because when you speak concerning the subjects that are brought up in Romans chapter 1, which includes um, homosexuality as a sin, when you teach the passage the way that it is intended to be communicated, you are going to be cited for hate speech. So there are laws against you preaching the full counsel. In Sweden, a pastor was put in jail for preaching Romans chapter 1 because they have laws against hate speech there. 
And so you have to make a decision. Do I teach the whole counsel of God or do I refuse to? As a minister, I'm called to preach the whole counsel of God which means that should the United States continue in the direction that it's going, there's a possibility of intrusion of the government within the confines of the church. It's interesting how separation of church and state only works in one direction when the government wants it to work in that way. But the government is willing to meddle in the affairs of the church and does all the time. And so the day may come when I stand up here giving the word and there are hate speech um, advocates who might make a complaint because laws have been passed. And the fact of the matter is, is we one day may end up going to jail for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But should we obey men or should we obey God is the question. And the answer is we obey God rather than men. So we'll go to jail and have Bible studies there because that's what's gonna happen because that's what God has called us to do. That's how it works. You see, as all of this is taking place, he's speaking concerning the will of God. And he's, he's sharing, this is the will of God. And I want you to notice in verse 15, he says, this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put into silence the ignorance of foolish men. By doing the will of God. Now we read concerning the will of God in Scripture fairly often. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 speaks about the will of God in this way. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Or 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, the Apostle Paul writing says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In Romans 1, the Apostle Paul was making plans, and he says, Making request if by some means. Now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. So the will of God is just wanting to be in the, uh, the stream of where God is moving you. Here, the quality of lives that he's speaking about that are going to evidence the will of God are going to be lives that are blessed and peaceful and self-controlled. And he said, these are the lives that will glorify God. When he says in verse 15 that you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, he's simply saying that by living a life that is blessed by God is going to actually put a muzzle on a detractor and their verbal viciousness will be silenced by your good behavior. They'll have nothing evil to say of you. Continuing, he goes in verse 16, as free yet not using your liberty as a cloak for vice, but as servants of God. This is a very powerful scripture, guys. It's a very powerful scripture. I want you to see it. I'm going to spend a couple moments looking at this with you. As free, yet not using your liberty as a cloak for vice. We're free from the law of Moses. Let's make the context clear. We're free from the law of Moses. The law of Moses does not, is not my guideline. The law of Moses isn't something that I am under. I have liberty from the law of Moses. But just because I have liberty from the law of Moses not being a Jewish individual, and he's actually writing to Jewish believers, but I, as a non-Jewish individual, I'm free from the law of Moses because I have liberty. Well, liberty is from the law of Moses, but this liberty that we have actually binds us to a greater rule of life. And the greater rule of life that this liberty binds me to is love. Love for God and love for others. In Galatians 5.13, Paul said, for you brethren have been called to liberty, only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Do not use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. There are those today who look at grace as being permission to continue in sin and go to heaven. They're misunderstanding grace. Grace was not extended to me or to you. Grace was not given to us as believers to allow us to continue in sin, but to free us from the power of sin. Now that I am in the grace of Jesus Christ, it's not permission for me to go out and do the things I used to do and continue in that. God has given to me grace to set me free from the bondage that I had in the past to a variety of things, including to my religious preoccupations and things that I thought were right with God. This grace that has been given to me sets me free to serve Jesus Christ because at one time I was in bondage to sin and now I'm free because of Him and His grace. But the Apostle Paul made it very clear in verse 1 and 2 of chapter 6 of Romans when he said, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Then he goes on to say, Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? So there's a mistake that I've seen even in the church today where people are using grace as a cloak for sin. They're hiding behind it. They're saying, I can continue doing these things. But the bottom line is we were set free from the power of sin so we could be set free 
to serve God with a complete heart. Listen, you were saved not to continue living in sin. And it's a great deception when you think that you can continue in sin and have no penalty as a, re uh, as a result of that. Fear of God is a very important thing. You're going to see that in just a moment where he speaks about fearing God and honoring the king. Fear of God is a very important thing. It's one of the things that is the earmark of a believer, and the lack of the fear of God is the earmark of an unbeliever. They have no fear of God in them, the unbeliever. And so, liberty. The way it works is this, and I'll share very br briefly about this, but it's really worth looking at deeper, and we're going to do so when we get into 1 Corinthians 8 next week on Sunday night. Liberty. You have what are called legalists. Some of you have heard that term, legalists. If you haven't heard the term, a legalist is an individual who has rules of conduct that you need to abide by in order to have a right standing with God. So if you came to, to faith in Christ in a church that is filled with legalism, they would give you a lot of rules and regulations there that you're supposed to abide by that are not even scriptural, they're just the way that this church runs. So you may be, as a woman, will say, you'll be told in certain legalistic circles, uh, you can't wear makeup anymore, and you can't wear jewelry, and you need to be careful to wear dresses that drag on the ground when you walk in, because you don't want to stumble anybody, and, and, and that's legalism. I, I think that makeup is a blessing from God. <laughs> and I thank Him every day. <laughs> but you may have that. There's this attitude that you, you, you can't, you can't do this or you can't do that. It's all legalistic. It's not what you do in terms of, of your relationship with Christ. It's what you're not doing that makes you spiritual amongst people. And so it's legalism. And they keep you in bondage. I remember when I first got saved, I got saved, as all of you who know this church, I got saved as a hippie. I got saved with long hair. But there was a church at that time. It was a very large church. It was in Indiana. I remember reading of it well because they had a barber on staff. True story. They had a barber on staff and if some hippie got saved, they would usher him into the back to get a haircut to prove that he was really saved. Because everybody knows that Jesus Christ had a crew cut. Everybody knows he had a buzz. Everybody knows that. And, and that was, that's called legalism. It's, it's trying to, to put you in some cookie cutter kind of Thing that makes you look like everybody else because we all look alike, you know, some place, same place, same time, that kind of mentality. We just all kind of like, and, and, and that, that's not how it is in the body of Christ. It's never been and it should never ever be. Legalism. It, it's, it's defined by, by the rules and regulations that you abide by and the things that you don't do. But then you swing the pendulum somewhere else and you can get to what is called license. This is where you get the word licentious from. The one who is licentious is the person who has no law. They're antinomian. They're people with no law, no system in their life. And so what happens is you have one person saying, you can't do this and go to heaven. And then you have the other one saying, you can do anything you want and go to heaven. If you want to do it, do it. You're free in Christ, free indeed. If anybody's set free by Jesus, he's free indeed. And they'll preach the freedom that you have in Christ. It's called licentiousness. And that's what Paul was arguing about. What? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How can we who have died to sin live any longer therein? Because they, they were arguing at that time in the book of Romans, there were those arguing that Paul was saying that Moses' law is no longer abiding or no longer in, in, in effect. And therefore, he is saying that you can do anything you want at any given time and it all comes under grace. Paul said, no, I'm not saying that at all. What grace does is it sets you free from the bondage of sin and sets you free to follow Jesus Christ. And so the third word, instead of legalism and uh, licentiousness, the third word would actually be liberty that is founded on love. Liberty in Christ is the freedoms we have in Him because we love God and love others to live in such a way that we can bring honor to Him and have joy in our life. Never allow legalism to dominate because you're not better than somebody else because you don't do certain things. Today there's an argument right now. You can't really be a solid Christian. You've got tattoos. 
I get letters from people. Pastor, doesn't the Bible say that you can't have a tattoo? And, and, and it's a question. But really what's happening is people saying, well, see these, these kids with these tattoos and this and that. These kids are not really saved because if they were saved, they wouldn't mark their bodies. Well, you know, I see these women, they put these little, little doves on their lower back here, and, and it may be cute now, but one of these days when they're walking, that dove's going to be flying. <laughs> that hummingbird becomes a vulture. Your third service, I can be a little looser. <laughs> but is it a sin? No, it's just gross. <laughs> we gotta be careful. <laughs> you know, and I do, I have people asking about that. What do you think about this? And what do you think about that? What's it say here? What's it say here? You know, don't use your liberty to cause other people to stumble. You know, and there are others who they really don't understand what liberty is because liberty is the freedom that Christ gives to us to love God, to love others, and we're going to live a life that demonstrates that. Again, love does no harm to a neighbor. So love God. And as you love the Lord, you'll live in liberty, and you won't be using God's grace as a cloak to continue in sin. You know, that saying, don't judge me, only God is my judge. Well, come on now, there are times when I as a brother have to approach somebody, and I've been approached. I know the unpleasant feeling of coming into conviction because I've hurt somebody. I know the feeling. And you have to listen to what they say, and you have to, if it's of scripture, you apologize. God, forgive me, and I'm sorry I hurt you. I didn't mean to. And you humble yourself, and the Lord moves. Why? Because that's love because you want God to be honored, you see? And we don't use our liberties as a cloak to hide. You know, there are some people who don't understand that to this day. And so they say, oh, you can't judge me and you shouldn't judge. No, Jesus said, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And what is righteous judgment? Righteous judgment is knowing the scriptures, knowing the spirit of the Lord as he moves through those scriptures, and then having a discernment that is capable of using the scripture in a proper way to be able to point us in the right direction. That's what the Lord calls us to. So the Apostle Peter's speaking about that, and he's making it very clear that we can have freedom, but we don't use our liberty as a cloak for vice, but rather, he says, be a servant of God. And then finally, he says, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. I want you to see this because you, you can combine honor all people and love for the brotherhood, and you can actually combine fear God and honor the king, and you can get a full picture of what he's talking about. Honor all people in general. Show respect to people in general. That's the way that we ought to be. We ought to honor people in general, but we also love our fellow believers. All people are to be honored, not just the noble and not those who are in government. All people are to be honored because they're created in the image of God. And so we honor people. But not only do we honor people because they have been created in the image of God, but we also love our fellow believers because we're family in Jesus Christ. That's what Romans 12.10 says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. We love one another. Why? Because loving one another demonstrates that we know that we've been bought by a price, Jesus Christ's blood, and we've been brought into a family. So Christians of all people should love one another. Jesus said by this, shall home and know you're my disciple if you love one another. And so he's just making it very clear. You honor all people, you give a general respect, but you have a special love for those who love Jesus Christ. It's a family in God. Then he goes on to say, fear God and honor the king. Now it's interesting because notice in verse 17, he began with the word honor, honor all people. Then he closes in verse 17 by saying honor the king, but in between, love the brotherhood and fear God. That's an interesting thing because what he's saying is this. If I really am honoring people and loving brothers, that's all going to be based on one thing and that is the fear of the Lord. And that fear of the Lord is also going to motivate me to honor those who are in authority over me. But I don't honor those who are in authority over me just because they are. I honor them because I have a fear of the Lord first. Somebody did a research, kind of did research on what was called moral development. 
actually develops several stages of moral development. And uh, the lowest stage, if you were having a, a ladder with rungs that you were climbing towards the highest stage, the lowest stage, the bottom rung in his research, was that people will do right things and abstain from doing wrong because of their fear of government. If they're afraid of getting arrested, they won't do it. That doesn't make them better, it just means that they restrict what they do because the law says I can't. But this guy in his research pointed out that the problem with that kind of thinking morally is this, if it becomes legal, then I can do it legally and it then automatically becomes moral to do it. So you pass a law in California that says uh, you, can, you can smoke medicinal marijuana if you've got certain kinds of, of uh, eye problems like glaucoma and suddenly everybody's got glaucoma and they go to their physician on hold or wherever and get a prescription filled. And they'll argue with you. It's legal. You've heard it, have you heard it? They'll say it to you, it's legal. So legal to them is moral. Do you see that? Legal to them is moral. If it's legal, it is moral. If I can go with my prescription to one of these places and get my prescription uh, marijuana, it's legal, therefore it's moral. Who are you to judge me because I have glaucoma or whatever? That's the argument we're having right now. So they equate legality and morality. That's the lowest on the rung, on the ladder. Abortion is legal, therefore it's moral. We've been arguing that for many years. Some of those who are the strongest proponents for abortion were the strongest voices against it. And some of you are not old enough to remember when Jesse Jackson said that abortion was going to hit the African-American community harder than any other, and therefore it was racist in its origin. I'm old enough to remember that. I'm old enough to remember Jesse Jackson arguing against abortion, and now he's a proponent. What happened? It's been legal for 40 plus years. That's what happened. That's how it works, and that's how it finds its way into our society. That's what's taking place right now with the legalization of homosexual marriages. If it becomes law, it becomes moral. Now, on this man's theory, he said the highest form of morality is a morality based on the fear of God. This was not a Christian, by the way, who did this. It was in his studies and his research. He said those with the strongest form of moral development are those who believe strongly in God. Why is that? Because they took the scripture as their guideline and not what the law said. Because the law changes every 10 or 12 years. Something that was once looked at as wrong is brought in as being right. But God's standards are unchangeable. And so believers will fear God, then they honor the king. Notice he didn't say honor the king and then fear God. He said honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king, because those are couplets, they're brought together, because if I'm going to be able to love the brotherhood, I need to be able to have a general respect for people in, in, just in general. If I'm going to honor government, then I, I'm gonna have to have it built on something stronger than just what the law is today, therefore I fear God. So fearing God will cause you to be a good citizen, because you owe your allegiance to that which is higher you have a higher standard and a higher authority, which is why Christians have always been the best citizens of any nation, because they fear God. When you fear God first, then you're able to do the other things. But when you fear man, that simply means you're afraid they're gonna restrict your behavior. When you fear God, there's an internal submission to the things that God gives you to do, and you do that willingly because it glorifies him, which is a higher standard, and that's why the Apostle Peter would say that you honor men, but you love your brothers. You fear God, and then you can honor your king. That's how it works, and that's what we ought to do too.